Welcome to Record, Mix and Release, a YouTube series which takes you through the process of recording a song from beginning to end in your home studio and releasing it to the world. And in this episode, we will be mastering and exporting our song. Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well and welcome to the 14th episode in this series where we record, mix and release a song to the world from a home studio. And in this episode, we are going to be mastering and exporting our song ready to release it to the world. A big and important episode, so please don't miss out. Now, if you wanna make sure you are notified about the other episodes in this series, or indeed other content on this channel, all about home recording, DAWs, gear reviews, plugin reviews, that kind of thing, then please do subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you are notified about those other episodes. Now let's get into some mastering. Have you noticed that although there is always a new plugin or a new app on your phone that enables you to do something these days, it's often an advantage if you knew how to do it in the old, more manual way. I'll use an example here. We've all got guitar tuners. We used to have to buy actual guitar tuners. Now it's just an app on your phone. But when I was growing up, I didn't have a guitar tuner, which meant I had to learn to use my ears. We didn't have internet sites to get tab of songs or even get lyrics of songs, and you had to just listen to the tracks really really carefully to figure out the chords the notes the lyrics all that sort of stuff now I use all of the new technology just the same way as you guys do, but I feel it was an advantage to have done it in the old way. Well, I think the same applies to mastering because especially in the last two to three years, I would say there's been quite good new plugins which have come out which make mastering an absolute breeze, much, much easier to do. But I do think it's an advantage to know how to do it in the much more sort of manual step-by-step -step way. There's a purpose to this little speech. This particular video is gonna be about how how I master this song now. And I'm gonna do it in a very, very easy way using some newish plugins. But I do think it's an advantage to know how to do it in the old way. And I did make a video about that methodology and it was mastering in Cakewalk by Bandlabs. Even if you're not a Cakewalk user using different DAW, then I think this is a really good video for you guys to watch, to learn the real ins and outs of the process of mastering. So I'll put a link to that video just up above and in the description down below but what we're actually going to cover today is how I do master in the year 2019 probably 2020 by the time you watch this so here I'm in my project and I'm really, really happy with my mix, lie. But regardless of my methodology for actual mastering, I'm gonna always do this first step. And that is that I'm gonna export this whole project to a stereo WAV file. Now there's some good reasons to do this, which I'll get onto in a moment, but I'll start the ball rolling because it takes a while to do it. So I'll go up to file here. I'm going to export audio. And in the settings down here for the sample rate and bit depth, I'm just gonna keep them the same as whatever my project was. So I can see that up here um, in, in Cakewalk at the top here. You'll have to look in your DAW for the settings, but there's no, there's no advantage to putting it at a higher setting and why would you put it at a lower setting? You've still got some work to do on it. So I keep the same settings there and I'll just give it a, a name, which is I don't buy. There you go, and I'll click on export and we'll get the ball rolling. So why am I exporting to a stereo wave file? Well, I'm gonna import this stereo wave file into a completely blank project, and that's where I'm gonna do the mastering. There's a few reasons for that. This project already has around about 69 individual tracks, then a whole bunch of buses. Probably I'm using, I don't know, over 100 channels altogether. Um, quite a few effects being routed around. Um, and I've got a pretty powerful system, but it starts to chug here and there. Put it this way, I do save often. I've been okay, touch wood so far, but I start to feel that it, when I start to add some of these mastering plugins, which can be really kind of heavy, things might get a little bit out of control. So that's the first practical reason for doing that. Um, if you're happy with the power of your system and you wanna go ahead and actually do your mastering in this project, you can. The other thing is I like the separation of tasks. I like the fact that I'm dealing with mastering in a completely separate mind step to mixing. So um, in, in the past, in the old days, you know, you 
it would have been separate people doing it and the mix engineer would have passed it to the mastering engineer and the mastering engineer was not at all interested in individual tracks because it was never going to be remixed possibly unless it went back for remixing but he wasn't going to remix it at all and i think there's something nice about committing to a mix and saying well you know i may not be perfectly happy but this is the way it's going to be so you definitely want to make sure that it's in good shape before you go to the mastering stage. I would have tested it on different systems at this stage um, and just made sure that I'm not trying to ask the mastering engineer, which is me, <laughs> to fix problems which are in the mix. That's not a good attitude to have. Have the problems fixed in the mix and then look to add that little bit of extra something, that magic source with mastering. So I see it's actually already uh, exported my song so I can go ahead and start mastering. So here I am in a new fresh blank project. I'm just going to go ahead, go up to file, import, audio, and I'm going to bring in that um, wave file that I made just in the last little section there, brings it into the project, and now I have my stereo wave file to work on. I'm just gonna do a little bit of preparation work on this, so I'll just make it a bit bigger. In fact, let's just drag all this down and give myself a nice big view of this wave file. So here it is in all of its glory. The first thing I'm just gonna do is just tame it a little bit. It's not quite hitting um, the peak of sort of zero dB, but it's getting up there and I just want a little bit of headroom to work with. You don't really have to do this. There's a lot of people who are gonna say stuff, complicated stuff in the comments about why I don't need to do this, but hey, I do it, it works for me. So I'm gonna go across and just go to normalize and rather than set this to the normal zero dB that you might be used to doing for normalizing, I'm gonna go to around about five dB. So it's just making sure the absolute peak of the wave is at minus 5 dB. It doesn't have to be minus 5, it could be minus 3, minus 6, whatever you like. You can see that this is a nice healthy wave file now with lots and lots of headroom. Now it's made it quieter. Why would you make it quieter? I hear you ask in, in mastering. Don't worry, making it louder comes a little bit later and it's going to be loud enough. So the next thing I do is top and tail it. Now there was no space right at the beginning of this particular song. I'll just play it it just gets going right away. So I don't really need to uh, get rid of any quiet space at the beginning. But what I will do is zoom really, really close in and just turn my snap off and I'll do the slightest of fades there. That just makes doubly sure that there's not gonna be any pops or clicks or anything like that at the beginning. And now that I've done that, I'll go towards the end of the WAV file where I've got a fader out. So what I'm gonna do here is just play this little section. I think there's a last little chord there and it fades out. I'm just gonna try and find the point where I'd like it to end completely. I'm gonna say around about there is enough just feels right there. You need to go and feel for this. It's gonna depend on um, maybe the album and how it's gonna go into the next track as well, but that's where I like it in this case. And then I'm gonna just do a fade all the way up to almost the point where that chord was struck. I'll just have a listen to that. And that's that, that feels okay to me. So that is the song topped and tailed and kind of set to a level which I think is gonna be good to work with. And the next thing I'm gonna do is work through a method of mastering which I've been doing quite recently, but I don't actually do it anymore, but it's really worth a mention. So whenever I'm talking about mastering with people online, it's often mentioned to me by people that they use um, the Ozone Mastering Suite from Isotope, especially the more recent ones. And there's some really good reasons for that. And I was using it quite a lot up until recently. And I haven't changed because there's anything wrong with it at all. It's just that I've found some different ways of doing things, which I will talk about in a moment. But I thought it was really worth mentioning this and having a quick look at it especially if you are new to mastering so I'll just open up the the suite here it's applied just as one plugin uh, on my channel there and what you have inside of there is lots of different modules you can see it's loaded up with an equalizer a, a dynamics uh, processor and also a maximizer there this is some of the basics that you would use for mastering but there's a few other modules as well each of these by themselves are really really powerful modules so you 
you get an awful lot in there. But what's really cool recently in sort of more recent versions of this, and I should mention that this is version 8. There's a newer version than this even out, which has some even nicer automation in it. But um, in this particular version, um, what they had was the mastering assistant. So what you can do, um, I've moved the play ahead to the loudest part of the song, and I've uh, actually muted it so that you guys are not actually going to be able to hear this, but uh, the computer can hear it or the plugin can hear it. Anyway, I go to the loudest part of the song and I go to Mastering Assistant here. Um, I want to do streaming. I've got some choices here streaming, CD, or reference. So I'm going to use streaming, click on next, and then I start to play the audio in my song. And as I say, I'm playing the last chorus, the, the loudest part. And it goes through and it analyzes it, uh, different aspects of it. And then it comes up with a starting point for you, a place. Um, where, well, for some people, with what they're saying to me, this starting point is actually often their ending point. They just use this and they go ahead and release the song using this. I've more often find, found myself going in and tweaking things. But I mean, whatever uh, bakes your cake. So I'll click on accept there. And um, you can see that it's made some adjustments here, very minor adjustments to an equalizer there. Um, then we go on to the actual dynamics processing, which actually has switched off, not sure why. Um, then it goes through, it's applied a lot of dynamic EQ there, and it's done some maximizing to get the volume of the track up to a decent level. So that's one way that you can do it. Another really cool way that you can actually use this is to actually use a reference track. So what you do is you find a song, and I would always use a reference track in mastering regardless, but you find a song which you think is similar to the song that you're going to release, yeah, probably in terms of the style of the song, perhaps the genre and the sort of sonic qualities, and you load that into the plugin. Now I've got mine loaded up here, but I'm not gonna tell you what the actual original song is here because I'll probably get in trouble for some sort of copyright reasons. And I'm certainly not going to play you the song because then, you know, my videos would be demonetized and what have you. So <laughs> just as a bit of fun, um, now that you've heard bits of the song, in fact, I don't know if you've heard the whole song ever, probably lots of little bits and pieces of this song. Um, I'd like you to try and guess down in the comments which is the reference track that I've used. I'll tell you that it's um, from the 90s and uh, it was a very, very popular song. Should I go further than this? Female vocalist. Okay, that's as far as I'm prepared to go. And um, the first one who can guess the reference track correctly, I'll uh, I'll send you one of these t-shirts. One of these t-shirts. So um, yeah, have a guess down in the comments of what reference track. But I, it's a really good idea to have a reference track, maybe more than one, um, even if you're not using it in this way. And uh, it keeps you sort of mindful of the sort of sound that you're going for. Anyway, I digress. In this particular plugin, you can use the reference track. You can choose a particular section. I'm choosing the last chorus here, and I'm going to have it compare it to my last chorus, and then I'm going to use the mastering assistant here again. I'm going to click on reference, select my reference track, click next, and it goes through some automation again. I'll just play the song. It goes through that automation, but this time it's trying to make it more similar to that reference track. So it'll probably come up with some slightly different settings overall. So um, if you're new to mastering and you're not quite confident enough to sort of know exactly where you're starting and get going, I think this is a very, very helpful tool indeed. I was using it a lot. I mean, I actually started with earlier versions of, Iz uh, of Ozone when they didn't have these features in there and it was always good um, but it's just so much better even now that they've got these kinds of features in there okay so let's have a look at my actual mastering so I've got my track loaded up here and you'll also see that I have a reference track uh, loaded up down the bottom here as I say I'm not going to tell you what the reference track is but it's similar in sound kind of to my actual song if you want to take a guess at what the reference track is the first person to guess correctly will get a free t-shirt not this T-shirt. That would be that would be disgusting. I'll send you a new one, I guess, um, from the '90s. Did I say it's from the '90s? Female vocalist. Anyway, have a good guess in the comments, and I'll let you know if you are a winner. So I've got my reference track loaded up, and I must confess that I've already actually mastered this track, guys, because it's a little bit tricky for me to actually master it and talk to you at the same time. I prefer to master on my speakers. The sound would be coming out of the speakers into the microphone. It all gets yucky, um, and also I can't really concentrate on listening to the mastering when I'm talking at the same time. So I've done the mastering and I'm going to run through uh, the chain of what I've done 
for you right now. Now, uh, the first thing I'll do is actually play the song without the mastering plugins uh, on at all. And you can have a listen to how it sounds before we apply anything. Now, I must warn you that when I switch the mastering plugins on, the ones that I've added, uh, it's going to get an awful lot louder. There is a volume difference between the two. So don't go turning this up as I start playing this music. So let's have a listen to the music. Okay, I'm just about to switch them on. Okay, so I know in the comments down below, people are going to say, oh, it just got louder. In actual fact, they're going to say it in that actual voice. They're going to, oh, it just got louder. Um, but And it did. It just it got louder, and a lot of it sounded better just because it got louder. But there's an awful lot more going on uh, underneath the hood, and I'm going to go through that with you now. So we're going to start off. We'll just zoom in a little bit so we can see what we're doing, and we'll start off with the very first plug-in that I put in the chain. And it is FabFilter Pro Q3. And if you've watched any of this series so far, you'll know exactly why this is here. This is a low cut filter, a fairly slamming, almost a brick wall one there. And that's gonna get rid of everything below around about 20 Hertz there because we can't hear that stuff down there, but it will feed through to the rest of the signal chain. Now I've already kind of cleaned it up on a lot of the instruments on the way into the mix. So there's probably not much down there anymore, but um, it's a kind of a catch all there. So it's just a little tidy up there before we go into our effects chain proper. And now the next thing I put in there is actually a compressor. This Pro C2 compressor. This is there just to tame the the really big sort of peaks which are there. I'll explain to you what I mean. If I just zoom into the top half here, I'll scroll over to the last chorus. And if you take a look there, just going into the chorus around about here, you've got these really sort of extraordinary peaks. They're mostly coming from Tom Toms there. And there's another couple of places in the song. So I've put a compressor on there which just catches those. Um, and it does it pretty quickly. It's got a fast attack, a fast release. It slams them down, and then that gives us quite a lot more headroom to deal with so we can bring the average level of the song up a lot easier at the end of the day. Okay, so those are just the kind of tidy up plugins there. So let's go back to our effects chain here and then see what's next. The next one that I'm going to show you is something that I've been using for a few months now. And especially for me when I want to get songs out really, really quickly, I just find this very, very quick way to do mastering. So it's by IK Multimedia and it's called T-Rex 1. Now what they seem to have done here is taken the one knob approach. You'll have seen some of these effects which just have one knob and they've kind of applied it to the whole mastering effects. So you end up with lots of knobs. <laughs> um, they all do one thing with one knob which would normally take quite a lot um, of doing. Um, so let's work through some of the controls that they've got here. Okay, so the knob at the top here is for air. That just adds a little bit of air to the track. Um, that's on very high at the moment. I'll explain something about that a little bit later. Um, the other one is a sort of focus knob here. This basically translates to um, accentuating the sort of low to middle area of the song. It gives it quite a bit more definition in the middle when you add this. The body, as suggests, um, adds sort of mostly just to the whole overall warmth of the thing. Then we have a width control, which adds stereo width really, really nicely, really subtly, but really, really nicely. Um, then we have a bass punch control where it takes nice control of the bass end of things and we can control how punchy that bass is. Then an analog control, which just adds a little bit of um, sort of well, saturation and stuff in there. It's very, very subtle, that one. Probably hard to hear the difference a lot of the time. So I've got it down fairly low. Um, then transients, where you can sort of control how uh, aggressive those transients are in the whole mix. And then we've got these two big knobs here. The first one is just a one knob for compression, and that's called push. Uh, really, really handy. I have it set up, to, and I'm just going to sort of leave it there for the moment. And the other one is volume. Don't confuse this with uh, sort of just an output volume. It's it's more than that. It's really uh, a limiter. Um, so 
So that's quite a handy control to have. I know I've rushed through them there, but um, if you've done any mastering at all, you'll recognize that a lot of these sort of one knobs will relate to whole components in other systems. And to be honest with you, it's one of those things where you feel like, wow, this should be more complicated than this, but I'm going, oh, needs a bit more body. Oh, I'll just increase the body. <laughs> um, and, and you almost feel guilty for using it because it's so easy to use. Um, if you wanted very, very, very price, precise control over things, then, you know, this is not for you. Um, but I find that I do get the results nine times out of ten that I want from it. So that's what I've used here. Um, I've added a fair amount of air to, to it, but not exactly what you see here. Because the other key component of what I've done... And let's just uh, zoom out again, um, is if we go to this track at the top here, I'll close my plugin off, and you'll see there's a few lines in there. Can you see those little hidden lines? You probably can't see those little hidden lines. Um, let's go in and highlight them for you, because what those lines are for is the automation. And I've done a fair amount of automation, um, almost all on this plugin. In fact, all of my automation is on this plugin. So here, for example, you can see the uh, automation on the track. This is for the width. Um, and I've got another bit of automation for the do, 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 the air control and then some uh, let's just move over so you can actually see that that's happening there just in that that's just in that section where just uh, the female vocal is there and then I also have some automation on the volume control but as I said this is not really a volume control it's really uh, more of a a limiter control so much more handy for bringing the kind of RMS up rather than the actual sort of peak volume so let's look at what kind of roles they've played I'll bring my plugin back up again if I can find it there it is over there um, let's just zoom into that for you guys so um, let's have a look at this plugin. So as I say, the air was automated. So where I automated the air was I actually just um, used that in the female vocal in the middle. So this section here, I'll just play it for you. And you'll see that um, under normal circumstances in the rest of the track, the air uh, value is right down here. But as we go into that female vocal section, it increases. Let's go. I am weather far, but you've been killed by what you Okay, so I've just automated it there, so it just really piles it on somewhat for the actual, it's really affecting the, the female vocal more than anything. Um, the other thing I've done um, in almost, I think actually every instance of the chorus, is you'll see the width control go up. So I've actually kept the track fairly narrow um, in the verses, and God, that's, I mean, it's tempting just to put width on everything and have everything wide, but it's kind of like one of those things that when it's there all the time, you don't notice it. So as it comes in and things get a little bit wider um, during the choruses, it just makes those choruses larger than life. And I've, this, I've not just dealt with width here, remember. I've actually dealt with width in the actual arrangement by um, having those like extra guitars and things which uh, pan hard left and right um, in within the things like the, the, the choir, which is at the end. You know, some things are panned really hard left and right. I've got duplicates of things. So I, I've dealt with it at, at that kind of stage of um, actually tracking the song and then in the mixing process, and then I'm accentuating it a bit more here. So the other thing that I've done is use this so-called volume control, which I really think is a limiter. And what I've done is I've given a little volume boost in every single chorus as well. And I've kind of just gradually brought it in as we build into the chorus. And then I've put like a little extra kind of peak just right at the beginning of the chorus. So you just get every chorus at the beginning gets a real sort of bang to it. Um, and then it sort of goes back down again for the verses and the other sections. Um, it's not like big. It's not like I'm going, you know, from zero all the way up to like this. It's not like big changes. It's, it's pretty subtle changes. But um, I think what the theory behind this is, is that the, your kind of ears 
kind of subtly detect that there's something new going on. It sort of keeps the listener awake um, and listening to the song in that way. So that is how I've applied um, all of those different things to um, this particular mix for my mastering. So I've taken care of the airiness of it. I've taken care of the body of it. I've dealt with the width by automating it. I've, I've just adjusted the punch of the bass end there add a little bit of analog treatment to it and dealt with the transients so the last thing that i actually do because i mean i think you could use this completely by itself and you could set up your uh, limiting using this control but what i let then like to do is go into uh, another ozone plugin which i use um, which is this one which is the maximizer part of the sort of ozone suite um, I just find this very, very handy to do. Remember, I'm looking for certain targets. I'll be, I'll be releasing this primarily for streaming um, for Spotify. So they've got requirements, and often they're looking for um, a, a, a sort of average level, of a, a, a LUFS level of minus 14. So you'll see sort of down the bottom there that, I've, that there's a target dialed in there. So this is a really handy feature of this particular uh, maximizer here here is that you can set a target le level and you click on this button here which is learn threshold and then you play the song all the way through and it listens to that song and it determines at what level it needs to uh, maximize the track to get that luffs reading so you know this is more about um, not an, sort of RMS is about the sort of the, the level at that particular time, but this is more about a, a level over a period of time over the whole song. So I find that uh, really useful. I usually just kind of set it, put it on learn, uh, and let it listen to the song. And I go away and have a cup of coffee and come back, and it's set up you know the threshold for me automatically. The other thing I do is set a true peak value here. Um, Spotify asks for a true peak value of minus one dB, so that's what I do. I set it to that, and it takes care of all that for me. I don't have to worry about going into the red or anything there. So essentially, that's my whole signal chain. I know I'd, I'd love to make it more complicated for you, but that's the way it is. Um, if you can't afford these kind of plugins, some of them are quite expensive then definitely check out my video. You can get the same results manually, but it's going to take a lot more practice um, and, and to get those results in a little bit more time. But definitely check out the other video which I mentioned before. I'll put a link in the description down below for that. Okay, so now I've done my actual master. All I need to do now is export it from Cakewalk, ready to upload to the sites that I'm going to use to stream it. So I can get rid of my reference track now. I'll just grab that and delete track. And then I'm simply going to go to File and Export and Audio. I've got a, a folder ready here for it. I'll give it a title. Um, I don't. Wish I could type better. Master. I don't buy it, Master. Now, um, I'm saving this as a WAV file. Um, remember, you just want to keep it at the highest quality for as long as you can because the streaming sites themselves are going to um, squash it and compress it and put it in a lower quality. You don't want to do that now. So don't go exporting it to MP3 or anything like that because you're already losing some quality as soon as you do that. So I'm going to a WAV file. I'm just going to keep the sample rate and the bit depth again at the same level I've been recording at. Now, if you've been recording at much higher levels than this, um, then you may, you may want to double check with wherever you're uploading the song to and um, what they require. But I know that the site that I'm going to be using is happy with these settings and it's the settings that I've used all the way through. So I'm going to go ahead, keep those settings and click on export and then that exports my WAV file. And that is the WAV file that I'm going to use when I get onto the next stage, which is the actual release of this song so that everyone can get to hear it. Thank you so much for watching this episode in the series. In the next episode, we will be finally releasing our song to the world. Now, if you liked this video, then you can show your appreciation by hitting the like button. It really does help me out. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about other episodes and content from this channel. And I'll see you in the next video.